The stomach is a J-shaped organ located just inferior to the diaphragm within the abdominal cavity. Here is the esophagus which connects to the stomach. The stomach then connects to the duodenum which is the first part of the small intestine. The stomach has four main regions, the cardia, fundus, body and pyloric part. The stomach has many functions. First, when we eat and food enters the stomach, the stomach mixes the saliva, food and gastric juice that it secretes to form what is called chyme. Second, the gastric juice that the stomach secretes to help digest the food are made up of many things. It contains hydrochloric acid, which kills bacteria and denatures proteins, pepsin, which begins the digestion of proteins, the intrinsic factor that aids absorption of vitamin B12, and gastric lipase, which aids digestion of triglycerides. Thirdly, the stomach serves as a reservoir for food before release into small intestine. This is because we eat much quicker than the time it takes for food to be digested and absorbed. Now, it's very interesting that the stomach can have many variations in position and contour which has an impact on how you look body habitus. The four recognized principal functional types of stomach are known as hypertonic, orthotonic, hypotonic, and atonic. In hypotonic and atonic types, the axis of the stomach is more longitudinal, whereas in the orthotonic and particularly the hypertonic types, it is more transverse. And these variations have an impact on body habitus, as you can see. It is very important to note that the stomach has four main regions, the cardia, fundus, body, and pyloric par. The cardia surrounds the superior opening of the stomach. The rounded portion superior and to the left of the cardia is the fundus. Inferior to the fundus is the large central portion of the stomach, the body. The pyloric part is divisible into three regions. The first region, the pyloric antrum, connects to the body of the stomach. The second region is the pyloric canal, which leads to the third region, the pylorus, which in turn connects to the duodenum. Peptic ulcer disease refers to painful sores or ulcers in a lining of the stomach or first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. Common causes include the bacteria Helicobacter pylori and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Signs and symptoms of a peptic ulcer can include one or more of the following. Abdominal pain, bloating and abdominal fullness, water brush, nausea and copious vomiting, loss of appetite and weight loss, hematemesis, malina. Sometimes an ulcer can lead to a gastric or duodenal perforation, which can quickly lead to acute peritonitis that requires immediate surgery. It is very important to note that the pylorus communicates with the duodenum of the small intestine via a smooth muscle sphincter called the pyloric sphincter. The sphincter helps control when food can move into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. Most commonly, two abnormalities of the pyloric sphincter can occur in infants, pylorospasm and pylorostenosis. First, let's talk about pylorospasm. In pylorospasm, the smooth muscle fibers of the sphincter fail to relax normally, so food does not pass easily from the stomach to the small intestine.
The stomach becomes orally full and the infant vomits a number of times to relieve the pressure. Pyloric spasm is treated by drugs that relax the muscle fibers of the pyloric sphincter. Pyloric stenosis is similar, but here what you have is a narrowing of the pyloric sphincter. The hallmark symptom is projectile vomiting, the spraying of liquid vomit at some distance from the infant. So remember, projectile vomiting is the key here, not regular vomiting. Pyloric stenosis must be corrected only surgically. Another sphincter in a stomach is esophageal sphincter, which has been seen if I make a section here. The esophageal sphincter is the barrier between the stomach and duodenum. Now let's continue and talk about the surrounding structures. The top of the stomach lies against the diaphragm. In clinical practice, sometimes in case of a defect in a diaphragm, abdominal organs, more commonly the stomach and small intestine, move upward into the chest. This is called diaphragmatic hernia. Diaphragmatic hernia can be congenital or acquired. In congenital, you have a defect in the embryological development of the diaphragm, resulting in a sufficient opening in the diaphragm to allow gastrointestinal tract organs to pop through and into the thoracic cavity. By far the most common cause of acquired diaphragmatic disorders is trauma, either blunt or penetrating. Motor vehicle accidents are the leading cause of blunt diaphragmatic injury, whereas penetrating injuries often result from gunshot or stab wounds. Clinical findings in patients with acquired diaphragmatic hernia may include the following. Marked respiratory distress, decreased breath sounds on an affected site, palpation of abdominal contents upon insertion of a chest tube, auscultation of bowel sounds in the chest, paradoxical movement of the abdomen with breathing, and diffuse abdominal pain. Remember that diaphragmatic hernias are different to esophageal hernias. Lying behind the stomach is the pancreas, an organ which we will talk about in other video. zollinger ellison syndrome is the gastrin secreting tumor of the pancreas that stimulates the acid secreting cells of the stomach to maximal activity with consequent gastrointestinal mucosal ulceration. Patients with zollinger ellison syndrome may experience abdominal pain and diarrhea. The diagnosis is also suspected in patients without symptoms who have severe ulcerations of the stomach and small bowel especially if they fail to respond to treatment. This might get confusing now to you, hopefully it makes sense. The stomach has two curvatures. The concave medial border of the stomach is called the lesser curvature. The convex lateral border is called the greater curvature. These two curvatures are very important and here is why. The lesser curvature helps the stomach attach to the liver via the hepatogastric ligament, which forms what is called the lesser omentum. The greater curvature has the greater omentum, which runs down over the small intestine and then falls back on itself and essentially attaches to the transverse colon to hold it in place. Let me make a section here and show you the structures which I've mentioned about. The lesser omentum connects the stomach to the liver. And here is the greater omentum which comes of the greater curvature of the stomach and attaches to part of the large intestine, especially the transverse colon. 
So remember, there is the greater momentum and the lesser momentum. But also there are other structures that connect the stomach with the neighboring organs. So here is a very simple diagram. Gastrophrenic ligaments connect the stomach to the diaphragm. Gastrosplenic connecting the stomach to the spleen nearby. We talked about the gastrohepatic ligament that forms the lesser momentum that comes of the lesser curvature of the stomach, connecting it to the liver. And finally, the gastrocolic ligament, which is actually part of the greater momentum, which comes of the greater curvature connecting it mainly to the transverse colon. Some sources say that the greater momentum actually contain the gastrophrenic, gastrosplenic, and gastrocolic ligament, which makes sense because the greater momentum does come of the greater curvature of the stomach, where these ligaments come from. Next, let's look at the layers of the stomach. The stomach wall is composed of the same basic layers as the rest of the gastrointestinal tract with certain modifications. From the outer layer in, we have first the serosa muscularis externa, which is composed of three layers in turn, longitudinal, circular, and oblique layer. Then we have the submucosa. Submucosa adjoins to mucosa, which I will draw here. The mucosa contains a muscularis mucosa and lamina propria. The surface of the mucosa is a layer of a simple columnar epithelial cells called surface mucous cells. These cells secrete mucus. The mucus layer is not a simple layer, it actually forms deep crypts which are basically called gastric glands. The gastric glands contain secretory cells. Several gastric glands open into the bottom of narrow channels called gastric pits. Secretions from several gastric glands flow into each gastric pit and then into the lumen of the stomach. The gastric glands contain three types of exocrine gland cells that secrete their product into the stomach lumen. Mucous neck cells, parietal cells, and chief cells. The mucous neck cells secrete mucus. Parietal cells produce intrinsic factor needed for absorption of vitamin B12 and hydrochloric acid. The chief cells secrete pepsinogen and gastric lipase. The secretions of the mucous parietal and chief cells form gastric juice, which totals 2,000 to 3,000 ml per day. In addition, gastric glands include the endocrine cells, the G cell, which is located mainly in a pyloric antrum and secretes the hormone gastrin into the bloodstream. Next, let's look at the stomach's blood supply. In order to understand the stomach blood supply, we must first look at the descending aorta and the celiac trunk. Here is the descending abdominal aorta, which has many branches of coming off it, that supplies the organs within our abdominal cavity. The celiac trunk is one of the first branches of the abdominal aorta. The celiac trunk has then three main branches, splenic artery, left gastric artery, and common hepatic artery. The common hepatic artery then has other branches including the right gastric artery. The lesser curvature of the stomach is supplied by the right gastric artery inferiorly and the left gastric artery superiorly. The splenic artery gives out the branch the left gastroepiploic artery and the short gastric artery which supplies the superior portion of the greater curvature of the stomach. The common hepatic artery gives of another branch the gastroduodenal artery, which branches to the right gastroepiploic artery 
that supplies the inferior portion or the greater curvature of the stomach. Now let's a little bit talk about the commonly performed gastric surgery to treat obesity. There are many people in the world suffering from obesity. If they try other methods for weight loss but these do not give results, many of them resort to surgical intervention. The three more commonly performed are adjustable gastric band, gastric bypass surgery and sleeve gastrectomy. One of the most common surgical methods to treat obesity is adjustable gastric band. A laparoscopic adjustable gastric band is an inflatable silicone device placed around the top portion of the stomach intended to slow consumption of food, thus reducing the amount of food consumed. The second method treating obesity is gastric bypass surgery. Gastric bypass surgery refers to a surgical procedure in which the stomach is divided into a small upper pouch and a much larger lower remnant pouch and then the small intestine is rearranged to connect to both. Any gastric bypass procedure leads to a marked reduction in the functional volume of the stomach accompanied by an altered physiological and physical response to food. The third surgical method of treating obesity is sleeve gastrectomy. In a sleep gastrectomy, the stomach is reduced to about 15% of its original size by surgical removal of a large portion of the stomach along the greater curvature. The result is a sleeve or tube-like structure. The procedure permanently reduces the size of the stomach, although there could be some dilatation of the stomach later on in life. 